Hi guys and welcome to another edition of Too Many Cooks with me, Charles Burns. Uh, today we've got Scott, is it Aaron or Aaron is the pronunciation? Aaron. Aaron. Um, yeah. And Scott's got a, an interesting backstory and does some like super interesting stuff now with coaching, lifestyle coaching and fitness and well-being and very well placed to talk about all those different things. Um, I think a great place to start, and I always like to start here, um, is kind of your like educational background, like what that was all, all about. Um, I noticed looking into, you went to University of Pittsburgh in 97, um, you, you, you're quite like an undecided major. We, at that point in your life, did you just not really know, like a people don't know, what you wanted to do? Was it just kind of like, I'll do this because it's a rite of passage? What was the situation? I was just partying. That's, that's all it was. I was there to party. You know, when, when you're, when you, I, I think about this often, you know, when, when you're a freshman in college mm-hmm. or university, you're 18 years old. Like I was a kid, like, <laughs> and I, I remember I, I went to, to college with one of my best friends. We were roommates our mm-hmm. freshman year. We ended up joining the same fraternity and everything. And I remember um, our parents were also very close. So they took like a U-Haul, which is like a rent, rent truck. And they, they, you know, I rode with him and our moms in one car and our dads were in the U-Haul behind lugging all our stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they spent the day like putting all our stuff in there. And then I remember at the University of Pittsburgh, they they had these three towers that all the freshmen stayed in. And it was like literally a hundred steps to walk up. So it was this huge staircase. And I remember Chad and I, we, we walked out of, uh, of our dorm Mm -hmm. and we said our goodbyes to our parents and, and, you know, it's so funny. I remember that as they started to walk down the steps, you, you, you know, when you watch someone walk down the step, they get lower and lower, and then you start to see their bodies disappear, yep. and then they're gone. And I remember turning to Chad and saying, dude, we're on our own. And it was, it was one of the most exciting feelings, but one of the most terrifying, because, you know, when you grow up and you have your parents there all the time, you know, they, they keep you on a schedule, you know, they, they take you to school, if you oversleep, all the, the your meals. Yeah. Now, you, you, I had no clue, zero clue about what personal responsibility was. Um, and it's good that I didn't because, you know, there's a lot to my story of, I ended up only staying at Pittsburgh for three semesters. My, my grades were horrendous. That was one. Number two, I actually had to come home uh, to transfer to Temple University in downtown Philadelphia, where I lived, to take over a family business because of some family issues that we sure. can get into. Sure. And that's and I have a I ended up graduating with a, a bachelor's degree in human resources. Which there's a funny story how that happened, and we can get into that too. Sure. So, um, so the family business. What what was the family business? It was a fitness club. So we ended up having uh, three health clubs, and my father was the big fitness buff. He, he still, to this day, competes uh, around the world in bench press contests. He was in uh, Panama and Japan last year. He was set to compete in the Czech Republic this year to compete at the Worlds, but obviously with everything that's going on, that got delayed. Uh, he still competes. He's 67, still benches between 315 and 330 um, uh, pounds. I think it's 130, 132 kilos is that right I, I'm 150. always it's 150 330 pounds wow that's, yeah that's crazy that's crazy. so yeah and, and he's 67 uh so he was the big fitness buff so okay. long, long story short my father was in uh the physical rehabilitation industry running multiple locations and ended up getting caught up in uh, an insurance fraud case that landed him in federal prison for two and a half years so my father, when he knew that his demise was obviously on the horizon, he ended up purchasing a failing health club in downtown Philadelphia that after he got sentenced and went away, was turned over to me at 18 and a half. So I had just finished my um, midway through my, my uh, sophomore year of college, and I had to come home midway through that, that first semester and re-enroll at a local community college. Uh, to get my grades up to then be able to transfer to Temple, but all while I was running my family's health club. And that's basically how I got into the fitness industry and ended up falling in love with it. Well, that's, that's a crazy story. I mean, it's interesting. Quite a few people I've interviewed, and it's, it's not through, that's not the reason I've interviewed them, have been involved with family businesses or certainly that's run through their veins. It seems to be a reoccurring theme, which is pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Some I've experienced as well. Um, 
and talked about on other podcasts and stuff. I'm kind of a third generation kind of uh, retail jewelry is our kind of background. Um, and, and family businesses are really tough, right? Like people think, oh, it's nepotism. You just get kind of a right of passage. Like that's just not how it works. It's so much tougher than a normal business by, by a long way. You know, you, you think it all looks good from the outside looking in, but you know, the fact is I got into the family business to, to help my family. You know, my, my father was the, the breadwinner and he went away. So I had to step up as a teenager to take over the gym um, to help the family. I had, a, I had a little sister and a mother to take care of, which inevitably I ended up falling in love with the, the wellness industry. I became a certified personal trainer, sports nutritionist, group fitness instructor, but owning a family business is, is not sunshine and rainbows. It, it's one of the most stressful things because, especially in the fitness industry, like you, I'm, I'm a fourth generation entrepreneur. My, my great grandfather, my family was originally uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia, and my great grandfather fled um, uh, Czechoslovakia in the late, uh, early 1900s to come to uh, America, uh, landed in South Philadelphia, where Rocky's from, and ended up becoming a butcher. And then my grandfather, who's still with us, he just turned 92 in February, uh, was in the pharmacy profession. He owned a pharmacy for a number of years. My father followed suit. He owned his own pharmacy called Scott's Pharmacy after I was born in 1979. And then he owned a couple industrial businesses and then got into the physical rehab where everything happened with the insurance fraud. And then that landed us in the, in the fitness industry. And, you know, we, we had a, an 18 year run. Uh, owning gyms, three different ones. And there was definitely a lot of ups and a lot of downs, but you learn from all those lessons in life to, to progress you forward to achieve what you really want. I'm curious. So you started, um, was this East Fall Fitness? Is that the company that it was? Or was that, that, was the, that was the last gym. So the first gym was called Old City Ironworks. And it was in, the, in, in a very, uh, just amazing location outside of Philadelphia. Uh, and it was an up and coming area. So it was, it was such a unique gym because it was a neighborhood gym. So there, no one drove. It was, there was just a bunch of apartment complexes. It was, a, it was just a beautiful community. Everyone walked and we had this big metal door garage that we could lift up when it was nice out. So people proper old school. Oh, it was just so cool. Like it was the cheers of gyms. It, it did not look the best. It was, you know, it was about 5,500 square feet, but it was, you know, I grew it from, around 300 members to close to 1100 by the time my father came back home two and a half years later. And the gym was thriving. Uh, in 2002, we opened up a second location about two miles north called Ironworks 2. And in 2003, we were actually approached by another family to buy both gyms for a million dollars. And we took the deal. So at 24 years old, I became a millionaire. And I, I just continued to personal train and really dive into that. I had a very successful six-figure coaching practice. And um, training was this still coaching? Personal training, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and you know, for personal trainers, they hear that they're like, "Wow, that's amazing!" And this was back in two thousand five, two thousand four. So before the internet really took over. So when when you hear that a personal trainer makes six figures, all that is telling you that they had no life because literally, I was at the gym from five a.m to 9 p.m. every single day. And uh, I basically just trained for about a year. And then my father wanted to get back into the gym business again. So we then, in 2004, opened up our final location called East Falls Fitness, which uh, I closed almost four years ago. So we had it for about 12 years. And it, it, was, it was difficult. That, that, was the, that gym was, the, was, was great, but it was the biggest challenge because what you have to remember is our first two gyms we had from 1998 uh, until 2003. Mm -hmm. And the gym business was different then. There, there was no LA Fitness. There, there, there was no 24-hour uh, no fitness. These, these, these big conglomerates didn't exist. We were a family-owned gym yeah. you know, that, that basically people would pay whatever you charged at that time. And when we, when we opened up the last location in 2004, everything really started to change. And it became, you know, you had the planet fitnesses of the world. It, it became very competitive. And, uh, you know, the biggest challenge for me personally is that, you know, because of my father's situation from the past, my parents didn't have credit. So right. 
I had to finance the gym myself in my name when we opened it. Mm -hmm. And three years into owning that gym around 2008, I found myself in $1.5 million of liability debt. So owning a business, no matter what people will tell you, it's not all, it, it's not what it all seems. It, it's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. People that own gyms, especially right now with what's going on, Charlie, is it, it's, gyms are struggling right now. They, 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 they're legally not allowed to be open. They are, they are forced to close. And think about personal trainers. If they don't have an online presence, their cash is, is running dry right now. So, you know, my, my journey in health and wellness was, was a, a wonderful experience. It taught me a lot, but I'm grateful that I got out of it when I did and, and was able to step into what I'm doing now. So you mentioned as well, you did, um, you probably more than this, but 65,000 hours of personal training, one on one to one, which is just a, a ridiculous number. Um, <laughs> what I'm interested in is, uh, a few things. So you talked about the gym industry changing. Did the way in which people train and what they're trying to get out of the gym change over the years? Did you see a big progression? Yeah, you know, back in the day, th there wasn't all the fancy equipment. There, there was no TRX. There was no resistance bands. It was machines and weights. You know, this is, you know, even supplementation was different back then. You know, the, the bars and the drink, it, it just... The, the industry was different in the 90s. It, it was just people that were personal training. I never, like even my entire career, I personal trained from two, 1998 to, to 2016, 2017. I never had to advertise. I, I was all referral based. I, I, I knew how to network myself. And, you know, I spent a lot of my time building relationships. But it's become such a crowded space because here's the thing, you know, anyone, they, there's apps now. People don't even have to go to the gym. They, they can just download an app and just work out from home. My, my sister and brother-in-law, they converted their entire basement into a full gym. It's like literally they have dumbbells from five pounds to 75 pounds. They have a squat rack. They have a pull-up bar. I mean, again, for me, you know, I, I belong to gyms, but my gym is closed right now because they can't be open. But so I, I ordered a home gym and it's coming in a couple of weeks and I'm going to install it here in my house and you do what you got to do. But the industry has become so saturated that, you know, every trainer is trying to look for that special edge. You know, what makes me different than any other trainer? Yeah. And my, my simple message, and if you're asking yourself that, like, oh, I have to have the fanciest, fanciest equipment. I have to know more about nutrition than anybody else. No. The best advice I can give any personal trainer right now is always be yourself. Always be yourself and look to give the best service and care for your client. Treat your clients not like someone that's paying you money. Treat them like family because that person not only will be loyal to you, they will recommend you to every single person they know. It's interesting. So I was talking to another fellow, Chris Pinkley, and um, he's also he was over in the West Coast. Uh, in the similar time periods to you actually with um, being a personal trainer, we was very successful. And one of the things he was saying, the, he was saying like the simplest thing that people just don't do in that industry, and I'm sure this is across all sorts, and I've known it as well in business, is just showing up on time. Like, like the simple basics, people don't get like, you got to show up on time, be, be uh, motivated and do your job. Like he was saying, like, I didn't do anything all that different. I just showed up on time. And like, I, I treat my clients, as you're saying, like the proper way. and um, things grew from there and I think people are looking for these get which get rich quick schemes and I know you do a lot on social media comes to that in a second and that is a great tool but there isn't really a better replacement than word of mouth right it's organic word of mouth like that is your number one in any business um best strategy doesn't matter who you are or what size of business it is absolute the number one best form of advertising is the current clients that you have and that and, and I don't care how great your click funnel is. I don't, I don't care how great your SEO on your website is. The number one way, the best form of advertising is people that it can attest to your work. Now, for me, I was never late. I was always early. To me, on time was late. I yeah. always made sure that I was 10 to 15 minutes early. I always gave myself a buffer in case there was traffic or there was an accident, whatever it was. I always wanted to be there early. I always loved, like when I would go to train someone at a studio or at their apartment complex, 
what I loved is when they walked in, I was already sitting there waiting for them. Because yeah. they're, they're taking an elevator down. I'm driving across town and I'm sitting at that desk waiting for you. So yeah. I always want, like, that's the thing. My clients were number one priority. Being there on time, if not early, was even a bigger priority. Because the way that you do one thing is the way that you do everything. And that's yeah. what I wanted to see for me. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really great point. I'm also interested. So not only did the actual weights and I'm sure the kind of routines and, and the, the methods change over the period of time you, you were personal trainer, but also was nutrition such a big thing back when you started? It's always been a big thing and it just changed or what, what situation there? It was, it was, you know, cause I think about it cause I, I did some competitive bodybuilding um, later in my personal training career. But when, when I got started in 1998, there, all these supplement companies didn't exist. There, there were no real pre-workouts or any of that stuff. Like it was just, I mean, American Bodybuilding Company was one. Um, Isopure was another one. But I remember, I, I didn't know much about nutrition. I had to learn on my own, like just like myself, my father, like we, we were just always educating ourselves. I would go to the local deli and just get a half a pound of tuna fish salad because I knew tuna was protein, but it was also mixed with mayonnaise, which isn't that great. But I would go to the deli counter and I would get like a half a pound of turkey breast, but I didn't know that, you know, there's nitrates in that. There's a lot of sodium. So you start learning as you, you start earning. And that's the big thing. You have to educate yourself through the entire process. The best education I got in nutrition, honestly, was when I trained for my first bodybuilding competition, because I, I realized that, you know, for me, I, I wanted to be as big as possible at, at, my, at my height. I'm five, nine, but at the peak, I weighed about 205 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think guess that's what 95, 98 kilos, something, something along those lines, whatever 205 pounds was um, that that's, I just wanted to be big, you know, lift heavy weights. I did a lot of power lifting and uh, it, it, it took a toll on my body. Uh, and I, I, I lift, still five to seven days a week, but more precautiously. But in the same breath, when I trained for my first bodybuilding contest, I became aware of how much I was over consuming, how much food I was actually eating that wasn't even necessary. Now, there's, there's a devil's advocate to that. Mm -hmm. I no longer weigh my food or measure my food. If I'm, if I'm making oatmeal, I'll get a measuring cup and measure that. But when I make dinner, I yeah. eye everything up now. I, I, did, I did have a food addiction problem uh, doing bodybuilding because you get so addicted to measuring and weighing and the timer going off, time to eat, time to eat, time. It became compulsive. Yeah. Um, that, that's one of the main reasons why I retired from bodybuilding because I wasn't able to enjoy life. But what I can tell you now, Charlie, is this. There, is, there are so many bullshit diets out there that people are just looking to make money off of people. I believe in something called educational eating. Everyone, like, I don't care who you are, whether you're a nutritionist or not, everyone knows what's healthy and what's unhealthy. Yeah. Everyone knows what good forms of protein are. Everyone knows what good forms of carbohydrates and fats are. Listen, we're not stupid people. We're very educated. Yeah. We know, uh, you know, fish and chips, it's, it's good every once in a while, but that's not a good balanced meal. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's taking what we know as, as human beings and having common knowledge and eating sensibly. You know, do I go off the reservation and have cheat meals? Hell yeah, I'm a human being. But if 90% if of my diet is completely on point. I'm nourishing my body the right way. I can have all the ice cream and all the cheat meals I want because my body, and what people don't realize is this, your body craves crap sometimes. You need to have those cheat meals. You need to have that hamburger or the fish and chips every once in a while because if you eat nonstop clean, like no salt, no fat, no carbs, you're actually depriving your body and you actually do more harm than good. So give your body 
those meals where you have extra fat and extra carbs and extra sugar and extra salt because your body then gets programmed because your metabolism is running at such a great level, it just goes right through you anyway. Yeah, it's interesting. I was chatting to a dietitian just the other day, actually, and, and her, I was asking her how and why people fail diets often. You know, everyone goes in January or whatever the time, but summer I want to do diets and this, this, this. And, and her thing was like, and I, I've seen this as well, is people deprive themselves of things. So, that, you know, depending on how long your, uh, how powerful your um, willpower is, you might, that might last a month, six months, a year or something, but it isn't going to last a lifetime. That's not going to change habits um, by, by saying, oh, I'm not going to have that Big Mac once every, you know, whatever period of time, whatever it is. Like, it's not sensible. Yeah, deprivation leads to just bad things because then that's when people start binging, they fall off. It takes, it's been proven, it takes 66 days to create a habit. Right. So if you can maintain a healthy, balanced life and diet, you're good for life. And that's, that's what I had to do. I had to reprogram myself that this, this bodybuilding lifestyle is good if I'm bodybuilding, but I'm not anymore. I want to I wanna eat for my well-being. Mm-hmm. I want to eat for longevity. I also, I have a seven and a half year old son. Right. I want to show him what a healthy lifestyle is. I don't want to, I don't want him to see me carrying around plastic containers. I don't want him to see me measuring food and being crazy about, you know, going to the ice cream parlor and he's having ice cream, but I'm not. And then having him ask daddy, why aren't you having any ice cream? Oh, son, there's too much sugar in there. I can't have that. So, because people forget about that. When you have these little ones around you, they're watching everything that you're doing. So I want to be a good role model to him to teach him unconsciously what's good and what's bad without pushing it on him. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so at what period of time did you, so I presume you had your natural, your natural obviously guy that likes to perform at a high level and so bodybuilding was a natural thing and, and that, that became, nutrition became a focus point of that. Was yeah. out of that process then you became really into this uh, bodybuilding and you call uh, this, what you call a cellular cleanse. I've never come across that before. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so in 2013, I, I found a company called Isogenics because I was looking for, um, I was looking to get myself back on track nutritionally because I just, I became so addicted to this bodybuilding lifestyle. I needed something simple where I didn't have to think. And another one of my buddies who was a personal trainer and bodybuilder, he said, listen, I follow this great program by Isogenics. It, it's it's healthy meal plan with healthy meal replacement shakes and this cellular cleanse. And I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'm like, does that mean I'm just going to shit my brains out all the time? And he said, no. Um, he goes, it's, it's a cellular cleanse. So basically it's, it's rebalancing, you know, your organs and your metabolism and, you know, reestablishing healthy levels. And I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll give it a try. Hmm. And within two weeks I felt a difference. So I still, it's been six and a half, almost seven years. Yeah. So I, I, I have a regular meal plan that I, I follow six days a week and then one day a week, my fiance and I, we, we do a cleanse, which basically it's, we, we're, we use uh, a cleanse liquid from, it's a botanical blend uh, from this company called Isogenics. And then we have small snacks throughout the day and water, coffee, we can have whatever we want. And it's just a low caloric day. So basically it, it's, it's what, here, here's what people don't understand. Mm-hmm. There's one aspect of our bodies that we don't ever give rest. So we rest, but think about it. We wake up, what's the first thing? Got to have breakfast. Then I got to have another meal and then another meal. Yeah. We never give our metabolisms a break. They're always working. So my theory was, I said, you know what? One day a week, I'm not going to starve myself. I'm just going to take my calories down to a lower level where I can allow my body to reset, give my metabolism a break where it doesn't have to constantly break down food. Right. And honestly, it's allowed me to maintain anywhere between seven to nine percent body fat all year round for the last five years without even thinking about it so wow. it's it's something i recommend for everyone is it for everyone no but i i really feel the combination of understanding how to put together a healthy meal without measuring um having the availability of a meal replacement shake that that is dairy free that is gluten free that is soy free and hormone free but then having that one day a week where you're giving your metabolism a rest and reset, I mean, um, optimal health. Like I, I, I have felt the best that I've ever felt 
Um, even when I was cooking all my meals, bodybuilding, I, I felt like crap. I, I feel so good right now, energized, youthful. It's safe for kids. And it's something I get to experience with my family. So it, it's honestly, it's been an absolute blessing. That's amazing. I mean, it's something that I'm getting more interested in. I don't know whether it comes under this umbrella. So if people watching and listening think it doesn't, I'm sorry, but um, like kind of biohacking and that kind of um, really looking at your body as like a, a machine and like, how can I tune the inputs better to get the output better and that kind of stuff. And it's an interesting way of thinking about stuff. Um, you talk about as well, is this to do with this natural cleanse nutrition piece of being able to naturally like reduce cortisol and body fat and energy and like better sleep? Is that all part of stuff that you teach now or is it just something you do yourself that you end up just telling people about? You know, it's something that I taught for uh, about four and a half years and I had an online coaching practice with it. And, you know, it, that basically spurred into more high level business coaching. I'm still very passionate about nutrition, but what people have to realize is that you know, uh, our stress levels basically make or break us personally and professionally. Yeah. You know, people don't understand that your cortisol is the driver. I mean, people think that, you know, losing weight is such a difficult thing. And, and I get it for a lot of people. Sometimes it is a challenge. But once you can get your stress under control, uh, once you, you're getting proper sleep, people stay up way, they stay up way too late for, for no reason. You yeah. know, if people just actually were more mindful about what they ate and went to bed just an hour and a half earlier, mm -hmm. 30 days later, I guarantee you they would lose weight because the, the, one, the one time period that people don't realize we actually burn the most consistent calories is while we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. That's the one activity that we can do where we're burning the most consistent amount of calories. So it's one of those things where I learned being for more mindful and understanding if I can control my stress levels, which is basically just being more mindful and positive and gratitude, that if I can lower those cortisol levels, that I'm naturally going to increase my body's metabolism, which is then going to allow me to just feel and look better all the time. And again, there's a lot of people, especially in corporate, I mean, they're just running, running, running all the time. Their cortisol yeah. levels are jacked up. So by the time they get home, they just crash. They're, yeah. they're eat, eating things that they shouldn't. Their, their, their energy is low. Their sleep patterns are off. And all that is is your body telling you to say, hey, slow down, get more rest, and start eating better. You have to understand, I eat for fuel. I eat to feed and nourish my body. So you have to understand, our bodies are incredible, incredible things. Mm -hmm. We just tend to abuse them more than we should. Do I have uh, a half a glass of red wine every single night? Yes, for two reasons. Number one, I love red wine. <laughs> and number two, because it's good for my heart. I don't have six glasses a night. I have a half a glass. I have a three to four ounce pour of a good, healthy red wine every single night for my heart. So there is a purpose behind everything that I do. Do I have ice cream? Yes, almost every day. And it's either a dairy-free coconut ice cream or an avocado ice cream. So I have ice cream every single day. It's just coming from a different source. Yeah. And talking about different sources, quite a nice segue actually. And I, I tend to ask quite a lot of guests on this uh, from a personal perspective as well. What's your view on the new, uh, whether it's veganism or plant-based stuff, one, Two, what's your view on this new fake meat initiative with Beyond Meat, with Impossible Foods, that kind of stuff? And three, what is your view on this new cell-based meat? What do you think about those kind of three, three things? Well, so the, I, I follow uh, my protein that I use is, is plant-based. It's uh, brown rice and pea pod protein. Um, love it. it it's uh, having that, uh, a plant-based protein um, incorporated with um, and I love meat. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how the vegetarians and vegans do it. I just, I, I love meat too much. So I, I definitely do a combination of both. So what people have to understand is, you know, I had whey protein, I had whey isolates all the time, but when you can switch to a, a plant-based protein that still gives you that healthy balance of, of healthy amino acids, uh, healthy carbs, healthy protein. And here's the thing, everyone, the first thing they look at when they look at a protein shake, they look and see how many carbs they have. Mm -hmm. That's not a meal replacement. So I always make sure if I'm, you know, the, the protein shake that I use with Isogenics, it has around 280 calories, 24 grams of protein, 24 grams of carbohydrates. So it's a complete meal. I'm not depriving my body of anything. 
as far as the, the Beyond Meat, I've tried it. I love it. Um, I like alternatives because, you know, for the longest time, there, there needed to be advances in helping the vegans and vegetarians with getting their protein. Because if you think about what, what an old vegetarian and vegan diet was, they got their protein from beans, lentils, and nuts. And if you know anything about beans, lentils, and nuts, they're high in fat and they're high in carbohydrates. So there was a, a misbalance between their protein to carb to fat ratio. Right. So now with the advent of the Beyond Meat and the, you know, the, the plant proteins, it's helping even those people maintain a balance and a better ratio of what their body does require. And I think your, your third question was the... Cell base, so like actually making, manufacturing meat in Petri dishes. So I, I haven't really read too much on that or about that. So I, I'd be interested to, to hear your opinion on what it is so I can start educating myself. Well, the, the, I know there's a few companies. It's happening in the, uh, the seafood sector with fish. It's also the, the big company that I heard of from my uh, research is Memphis Meats. And they got about 150 to $160 million worth of investment. Um, I don't know quite how it works. My, my layman's understanding is that they take the cells and they're able to replicate the growth of the, the, the meat in literally a Petri dish. That's how I, I understand it. And so the idea is you're supposed to be able to get exactly the nutrition and all the benefits of meat minus the ethical dilemma, which opens a whole new interesting dynamic for those vegans that are only wow. doing this based upon ethics and it's like, meat. So it's, it's, meat it's like meat. growing meat, like literally. It's yeah. like instead of like growing fruit and vegetables, people are growing meat. I'm going to... I'm going to do some research on that. That is, I have never heard of that, but it's really interesting. Well, they're starting to, you know, if, I suppose it comes from the scientific stuff of them when they start to grow um, like cells for people that are having, you know, need um, not necessarily heart replacements, but that they, they're also looking to those sort of things. How can they actually use like biology and chemistry to actually help the human beings? And I think it's come from that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a super interesting area. I don't, I don't quite know what I think about it. I'm just interested to know you know, you're a nutrition guy. If you know, you don't, but that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, it's something, you know, I always like doing research. I like learning new things, but that's something that I'm definitely going to take a look at. That's really interesting. Awesome. So you, moving slightly uh, to a different topic, you then wrote a book um, called Good Guys Always Win. Um, what led you to write a book? What's it all about? Um, yeah. Let, let's hear about it. Yeah, that was my, uh, my first book. I just recently released my third book. So that book, actually was a challenge. Uh, I, I used to be on a platform called Periscope um, yeah. th that was through Twitter and people still use it, but I got off there. It was like, it was really weird. Weird people started going on there. And one of my viewers, I, I said, I want you guys to challenge me to something. And one of my viewers challenged me to write a book. Okay. And I said, okay. So it took me about a year and basically it's, it, it's called Good Guys Always Win. Um, you know, how to live your life on purpose and become your own hero. And um, basically, it was my story about, you know, what I had to go through with, you know, the, my, the divorces in my family and, you know, the bankruptcy and all, all the things that I had to go through personally, but also getting bullied and picked on as a kid and how you have to overcome those obstacles to become your own hero. Uh, and, and it's okay to look up to other people, but sometimes you have to look up to yourself in order to become the best version of yourself. And that, that book is probably the best example. And I released it about three years ago, but a prime example of, of how your life can change in a very short amount of time if you make new decisions to create the outcomes that you deserve. That, that's, that's awesome. Um, and at what point in time did you go from, all right, I'm in sports, now I'm bodybuilding and I'm doing some nutrition to, hold on a minute, like I've got skills outside this where I can help people being a life coach and then more recently into I can help with network marketing and using LinkedIn as a social tool. So in 2015, I was at a conference and I, I, it, I was seeing all these people go on stage and they were, they were writing all these numbers of conversations they had to have to get to where they were. And, and I was looking at, at Facebook and I'm like, I'm only allowed 5,000 friends on Facebook. How, you know, your net worth is in direct correlation to your net worth. And I'm like, I, I can't do much with just 5,000 friends on Facebook. I, I want to, I want to have more impact. I want to create more income. I want to, I want to have a legacy. Yeah. And 
I remember one of my first mentors said to me, she said, Scott, you got to look in the mirror and you have to ask yourself, how are you going to connect with yourself today? And it was this light bulb moment. I'm like, that's it. I, I can't just be looking for clients and customers all the time. I have to look for the business version of myself, other gym owners, other nutritionists, other personal trainers. And I said to myself, where can I find these people easily? And I remember LinkedIn. So I hopped onto LinkedIn and I changed my profile around and I started connecting and messaging and, you know, you know, talking to other people just like me. And they started responding and they started enrolling into my business and network marketing. And I was like, I think I may have something here. Yep. So I reached out to a buddy of mine and I said, Joey, listen, you got to get on LinkedIn. I said, here's what I want you to do. You know, here's a couple tips of what I know. And I want you to get back to me and, and tell me what happened. And a week later, he texted me and he said, call me. So I did. And I said, what's up? And he goes, dude, whatever you're doing, it really works. Because I have 14 appointments booked this week. He goes, what was that in? What, what business? Network marketing. Right. Okay. And what, what is that? For those who don't know what that is. So network marketing, it's, it's word of mouth marketing. So multi-level marketing, people think it's a pyramid or a Ponzi. Uh, basically, it's you become your own distributor within a company that you like Herbalife, uh, Avon, Mary Kay, whatever you have you. And I was aligned with a, with a wellness company because I was already selling supplements out of my gym anyway. It just made sense. Instead of me giving money to the company, why don't I just start my own business? Yep. And but the other aspect of it is not just distributing the products. It's also building organizations, teaching other people how to duplicate that and build their own business and create their own income. And I felt that I was going to have a better opportunity to grow my business, which I did. I, I earned close to $400,000 in the four and a half years that I built by building a team and teaching those people how to build a team and so on and so on. And, my, and you have to have conversations. You know, the more people that you speak to, the more opportunities you're going to have but I've always been into human connection. I've always been into how could I support someone else? How can I offer them something that's going to better their life or their family's life or vice versa? And I ended up in the meantime, creating this system on LinkedIn that I was able to patent trademark license and copyright that helps network marketers now build their business. And now it's kind of grown from there where I'm working with business consultants, I'm working with life coaches, I'm working with real estate professionals, people in the finance industry, because what I realized is that network marketing is just like any other industry that requires people for growth. If you need people to sell a product or a course or a book of business to, you need to be on a professional platform. So now I'm, I'm full-time coaching and writing books and speaking and doing all of these amazing things to show people that when you can become the best human connector, you can have the most conversations, you can grow the best business. And I think it's really interesting because there's a lot of people out there, and this is the, one of the primary reasons of this podcast, alongside meeting great people like yourself, was I want to speak to people that are real experts and leaders in what they do, not just ones that say and talk the talk that actually have stuff behind them. And one of the things that's fascinating that I found with you is you joined the Forbes Coaches Council. Um, well, we're invited to. Can you explain what that is for those who don't know? Yeah, so the Forbes Coaching Council, it's an invite-only council that, that Forbes has. So I, I had a, a marketing manager that was, I was working with, and she said, listen, I love your work. Uh, I'm a part of this thing called the Forbes Coaching Council where you can become a contributor, and I'm going to recommend that you be invited. So it, it's not something that you can just sign up for. You actually have to have a personal recommendation uh, to get invited. And then there's an interview process where um, you have to tell them what you do and you have to have credentials. And uh, it, it was, it was a, a, one of the biggest honors of my life. I've, I've been a, a member now for almost three years. And uh, you, know, you can write articles that are published on Forbes.com, in Forbes magazine. And it, it's really helped with my branding and my business because you know, I want to be a proven leader and a proven expert in what I do not just by me telling people that, but I want my credentials to show. So, you know, from the 400 recommendations to the number one, now two number one best-selling books on Amazon to everything that I'm doing, I don't want to have to explain that. I want my work to do that for me. No, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. And you, you did mention it 
um, in passing with the LinkedIn, how using it as a great tool. And I have, for my business, Allergy, used it extensively, spoken to like thousands of people across all different industries. And like, it's actually super simple. Like, it's just like reach out and like find something that'll interest them, like give before you get given, right? Um, what, what tips do you have people listening to this or watching this that want to um, get better and use LinkedIn as a tool? What, what's the kind of like the key things they're doing wrong right now that like quick fixes almost? Yeah, well, number one, if you go to my website, www.scottaaron.net, if you click on the tab where it says free infographic, this will give you six tips to optimizing your profile. That's number one. Um, you have to optimize your profile. There's a lot of search engine optimization embedded now. So making sure that your profile is filled out the right way, has the right keywords, where it's going to appear in more searches, you're going to get more visibility, you're going to have more conversations. That's number one. Number two is defining your avatar. So who do you actually want to talk to? You don't want to just talk to anyone. So if you sit down and you write down on a piece of paper, the industries or the professions of the people that you would probably have the most relatability and connection to, those are the people that you should search for and connect to to build your network around. So the problem is if you're not having a lot of conversations on LinkedIn, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. You're just not connecting with the right people. So they're not going to be open to even talking to you. So once you can define who you actually want to speak to, then you can search and connect with them. And therefore that will lead to more conversations. Number three is messaging people. This is where literally the wheels come off because I'm Charlie, just like, you know, myself, I'm sure you've gotten these big, long drunk log messages from people where they're like, check this video out, watch I this video, it. here's what I can do for you. Sometimes I'm like these days now, like actually will send a voice note or a message back saying like, stop spying me. Like, like sometimes, and then other times I'm like, honestly, like, can I be bothered doing that? Um, but I'll give you like a really, something that I actually came across is so some guys were trying to uh, market their business to me right and they were in like youtube seo and this is like a really clever use of technology messaging so i didn't know these guys like n n not at all and they used an app called loom have you come across this right have you come across loom before yeah 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 right brilliant app and like basically for those that don't know it's spelled l-o-o-m and it's, it's free to use and all the rest of it there are paid options but you can use it for free and what it does effectively is like you having a little, you're in the corner of the screen and you can navigate and show people what you're talking about on the screen. There's loads of use cases. How these guys use it was really smart. So they'd looked at my LinkedIn profile, they looked at my YouTube presence, and they also looked at my um, business website. It kind of led to the creation of this podcast actually to an extent. And like they were talking like, oh, hi, Charles, like this is what we're seeing here. Like literally like almost like stood lecturing at, at, in front of me as a keynote speech. And they send that as a three or four minute clip. And I was like, they've actually taken time. They've looked into what I'm doing. They've tailored it. Like, that's really smart. And I gave them the time of day just for that. You know, I actually wasn't even interested in the series, really. But like, I was like, that is so clever. If you do that, if your marketing is clever to me and you're trying to market your services, I reckon you probably top draw. And the, the reverse is true, right? If you're just spamming these like generic um, things to get leads, that's gonna, that tells me that when I work with you, if I ever work with you, which I wouldn't, by the way, then I'm going to get some generic cookie cutter. Here's what we do for every client we have, right? It's, it's one of those things. So the, I have something called the magic formula for when you're messaging people. It's three steps. Number one, if you're going to reach out to someone, start by mentioning their name. Hey, Charlie, great to be connected to you. Number two, you want to mention why you're reaching out without trying to sell or pitch. You're just seeking to connect. I saw that you also have a podcast, as, as do I, would love to hear more about yours, share more about mine to see how we can best support each other here on LinkedIn. So I've stated the reason why, and I, I actually created the connection. He's got a podcast, I have a podcast, this is why we should talk. And then the third part is finishing with a call to action, a CTA, questions lead to answers. Do you have any time this week or next week to hop on a call? That's it. State their name, reason for reaching out. Do they have time to speak? So the one thing that people have to remember is you have to ASK in order to GET. You have to ask to get. So if you don't ask questions, you're never going to get answers. If you leave a blanket statement, they're never going to get back to you. The fourth part, which is probably the most important, is going all in with content creation on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has the highest rate of content, not just distribution, but also content um, 
uh, that's being engulfed by people, consumption. So making sure that you put out one piece of content a day, whether it's a post, a video, an article, or a discussion in a group that does one of two things. Number one, educates your audience. How are you different than everyone else? What do you know about a certain topic that you can educate other people on? Mm -hmm. And number two, inform. What is something new that has come about that you want to inform them on that you can then educate them on later? So making sure that you do one of those two things, educating and informing in one of those four different fashions is going to make you stand out than everybody else. And that's a really great kind of point. And there's one final thing that I want to kind of round this off with. And again, it's something that's coming across in, from different people that I'm talking to. I've talked to a master of Pilates. I've talked to uh, NHS doctors here in the UK and various other people. And one thing that seems to stem, stem true, and it's maybe more of an, an American thing, but maybe this is why you guys, to be honest, from a British perspective, seem to punch above the average, is the use of mentors. And in the UK, it's not done so much. Like from what I see, it's hard to find the right mentor and then how, what the benefits of that. I know, I know roughly what the benefits are, but I'm struggling personally to find the right mentor um, that's got the time, that's going to be able to kind of actually add, add some value to what I'm doing. So what advice do you have to people that are looking for a mentor? And also, what are the benefits you see of having mentors? Well, it's funny. I had a new client hire me this week, and he's from the UK. He's in the fitness industry, fitness industry and he wants to learn how to leverage LinkedIn to build his business. So the one thing, I, I started hiring mentors seven years ago, um, and I, I've been investing ever since. The, what I learned is the best investment one person can make is in themselves. So when you hire a coach, what the, the mistake that people make is that they put too much weight on that coach's shoulder. Meaning I'm going to hire this person, here's what they're going to do, and my business is going to be changed. There, there's two things that, that makes a successful coaching experience. Number one is taking action on what you're taught. You can, you can train with Tony Robbins, but if, if you don't take action on what that coach teaches you, you're going to fail every time. And then what you're going to do is you're going to play the blame game. Oh, I just wasted this money. This person sucks. They don't know what they're doing. But turn the mirror around. Did you take action on everything that you were told to do? That's number one. Number two is accountability. You know, make sure, see how much accountability that coach is going to give you. Are they, do you just meet once a month and then, you know, they have, they can box you or, you know, WhatsApp you or whatever it is. For me, wh whenever I was doing personal training, but now my business consulting, I am very high on accountability. I, I do lifetime coaching. Once, once I work with a client, they're stuck with me. And again, that looks different to each client. Some of them I do a monthly check-in through Zoom. Others just want to email me questions or text me questions. So once I, I work with people, they know that I'm in their corner. I don't ever make them pay again. They pay once and that's it um, because I believe in over delivering. So if you're stuck in your business, don't try to take a shortcut. The, the point of coaching is hiring someone that in, in, an, in an arena, in an area of something that you want to learn. If, there's some, if someone wants to learn LinkedIn and how to market themselves and how to grow their business, that's why they hire me. They don't hire me to do Pinterest because I don't know shit about it. So I'm not going to teach it. I know what I know. So specifically look for the right coach for you of what, if that's what they do, that's who you should hire. Don't hire someone that's out of the realm of something that you want to learn. So stick yeah. with that. But number two, really focus on understanding that the investment that you make, it's going to come back X amount fold. So you have to take action and you have to be accountable for that. But making those investments in the right coach is, is paramount. But here's the thing. You're going to make a bad investment. You're going to hire a coach that's not going to be the right fit. It's not going to help your business. And you're going to be paying off that credit card. But the fact is you can't let that bad experience stop you from hiring other people. You have to move on from that. It's a learning lesson because every bad experience you have allows you to open the door to understand what a good experience should be. Yeah. And that's why I, I went all in with my coaching practice because I know what I deliver every single time someone works with me, that I'm going to give them 110% of what I have because their success, it's not on me. They ask me, you know, uh, you know, what's my ROI? You know, what am I guaranteed? I'm like, you're not guaranteed anything. 
I'm going to teach you exactly what you need to do, but it's on you to carry out what I teach you. Yeah. So your ROI, it's whatever you want it to be. As long as you follow the ingredients, you're going to get the results. Coaching is so important. It's so imperative right now. It's, it's, it's shortening the learning curve. It's not taking a shortcut. It's shortening the learning curve to get to where you want to be. And I can attribute my success in my businesses that I'm having right now from all the coaches and the masterminds that I've been a part of to get me to where I want to be. And I haven't stopped. I'm still hiring people. My, yeah. Myself and my fiance, we just onboarded a new person this week to help me with something. So you're, wow. you never stop. Once you turn that faucet on, never turn the faucet off. And I was, that was something I was going to ask you as well is, is, you know, do you practice what you preach? You also hire people in. So you, you find you've got like some, some area that needs addressing and you go, right, who's the best person that I can afford or whatever that's in this kind of realm? Is that how you work the it? The teacher is always the student, Charlie. If, if, if the person that you're working with isn't working with something else, they think they know everything, they know nothing. So I never work with anyone that isn't currently working with someone. Right. That's and one of my, my rules. My, my last thing is, do you therefore place less of a importance on, say, free mentoring where someone's just helping another person out? Do you think there's a place for that? Or really, like, actually, when you pay for it, it's a different relationship? It's, it's Listen, how many times have we been given gift cards and we've never used them? Sure. All of us have gift cards sitting around our house right now because you have to understand free only gets you so far. When you actually make a monetary commitment to something, yeah. you're going to do it. But if it's free, you might be a little bit lax. You know, I'm going to cancel the session this week. There's no monetary charge, so True. there's no skin off my back. So you have to understand you're not investing in that coach. You're investing in yourself, your business, and your potential growth. That's the big determinant. I think that's a superb way to end what has been such an interesting and wide wearing conversation. So Scott, thank you so much for your time. Uh, so much interesting information to digest, uh, both nutritionally, business wise, uh, coaching wise, network marketing wise. I mean, there's just, there's, it, do you, I mean, I'm going to listen back to this myself to figure out <laughs> what I can take, but uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Charlie, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be here today. Just grateful for you and the opportunity and, and thank you again.